फोर थ्री टू वन वी आर लाइव गुड इवनिंग एंड वॉर्म वेलकम टू दर्ड वेबिनार ऑफ इंडियन ऑर्थोपेडिक Welcome to the third webinar of Indian Orthopedic Association on the Soft Skill Development Initiative, taken by our President Professor Ramesh Sen. We also appreciate your learning mindset because you are the people who are always keen and enthusiastic to learn. I am Dr. Dhiran Ganjwala from Ahmedabad, along with my colleague Dr. Tushar Agarwal from Mumbai. We will be hosting the sessions for today evening. the first important point which i would like to highlight why we have selected this topic of non verbal communication we routinely communicate with our patient most of our communication is either verbal or written but we forget that we also communicate non verbally we give signals to our patient and at the same time we receive cues from them which is in the form of non verbal you will agree with me that most of the time when we want to make a diagnosis or we want to decide the line of treatment we need information and we uh, gather those information either from the history or from the clinical examination but the most important thing is like non verbal communication gives also a large amount of information and once we acknowledge that it's a powerful source of information we cannot neglect non verbal communication so non verbal communication is important in our practice we are not trained for effective use of non verbal communication and due to that either we give wrong signals to our patient or we miss a lot of information from them one of the important aim of this webinar is to make you aware about the importance of non verbal communication and we expect that after this webinar you will be able to sharpen your skill of non verbal communication and that will definitely help you to improve the practice so with that uh, let me give you some idea about the our faculty who are with us we have dr ram chadda who is the president sorry the president elect of indian orthopedic uh, association and he is a spine surgeon practicing in mumbai we have dr bharat dave again a spine surgeon he is a director of stavya spine hospital in ahmedabad and he is a past president of spine association of gujarat and education officer of ao spine dr guru reddy the chairman and managing director of sunshine bone and joint institute he has received a vast training for uh, from uk where they really give a lot of importance to non verbal communication for doctors so dr guru arundi is president of indian society of hip and knee surgeon association we have another esteemed faculty dr vivek trikha he is a professor of orthopedics at aims new delhi and he is also a chairman of education committee of indian orthopedic association before we start the actual interaction let me give you a brief outline about the session there will be no didactic lectures in this session this session will be fully interactive tushar and i will ask few relevant and practical questions to our experts and from that we anticipate that we will be able to bring out some important message we wish that you also participate in the session by asking questions you can ask your question by whatsapp on the number please note down the number it's 97129 25600 i repeat 9712925600 so with that we start our interaction and i would like to ask the first very basic question to dr vivek trikha uh, can you tell us something about what is non verbal communication and what we understand uh, by that how it is different from verbal communication yes yeah mm, thank you sir i would say that the word itself the non verbal communication it defines and it tells us that it is a communication or an interaction between two people which is not verbal so it is without the use of words by our expressions not using the words to say us express something we are doing it through our facial expressions how we convey our expression through eye contacts 
through the hand gestures which we are using and our body language that what do we mean and mean to say by those words if i can say it's more of a emotional or emotion conveying of emotions rather than a specific word and uh, i many a times tell my people who <laughs> in my rounds and in my juniors out here that non verbal communication is the cue or is the thing which differentiates a human being or a doctor from an artificial intelligence or a robot who is just going to be asking questions and looking at the alphabets listening to what i am going to say but not seeing the way i am speaking it the tone of my voice the facial expressions whether it is in good way that i am speaking in a pleasant way or i am under duress so these are the things which i feel that the non verbal communication means to express as yeah. you have yeah please yeah please please yeah sorry sorry to interrupt no i think that it is this are the things which are main thing it is when we are dealing with a patient and a doctor relationship i think as you have said it is a two way thing it's not only that we are gaining from the patient's verbal or non verbal cues that we look at and we try to decipher and get those things but i would say that the patient also is interpreting every nuances the way i am saying it or the doctor is saying and rather it's more important from many most it's also important from the patient's perspective of how we as doctors are behaving or are expressing our non verbal cues to him because for me looking at an opd it is maybe 100 patients in a opd and for me it's a routine thing maybe but for that patient it is the most important thing for him right now and every expression of my face even my furrowing of my eyebrows is going to give him a skip of the heartbeat if i am looking at an x ray so these are the non verbal cues which we all as physicians should be aware of of our own and also try to gather information from the patient not only what he is speaking but also how he is speaking those emotions or conveying those emotions rather than just his cognitive thoughts that's what i would say good that's very important and what you say is like uh, there are it's a two way communication so right. we are receiving the signals at the same time we are giving uh, out the signals so that is what the most important thing because we usually speak very casually and we re really don't pay attention to our non verbal uh, cues or the signals which we are giving so uh, before i come to uh, for the come to you for the next question i would like to ask dr ram chadda about uh, why we are giving so much of importance to non verbal communication and how it fits into the soft skill which we want to develop in our young generation yes dr chadda thank you very much dr ganjwala welcome to the entire uh, fraternity that has gathered today as faculty to discuss something which i believe is the most important part of communication mehrabian many years back spoke about percentages or percentiles as regards communication and he simplistically put it as 7% is verbal 38% is vocal and 55% is visual so it's just 7% the words we use 38% is the way we speak the tone and 55% is the entire image that is conveyed this may be different today in the post covid zoom scenario but yes it is still true that's the first thing i need to say the second thing i have over the years looked at certain personalities who have been charismatic one of whom happens to be a gentleman who was assassinated exactly at the time that i was born sir i was born on the 23rd of november 1963 at 5:13 am 
five hours before I was born, probably when my mother was in labor in Dallas, John F. Kennedy was assassinated. That he had a back problem and I became a back surgeon incidental. That he was assassinated around the time I was born and that he probably is the first person who made us realize the importance of nonverbal communication is something that I learned much later following a gentleman called Joe Navarro, who's basically an FBI agent who now speaks about this. On 26th of September, 1960, when John F. Kennedy, the underdog, was contending against Richard Nixon, vice president for nine years before that, Kennedy was Democrat, Nixon was Republican, and this was the first live telecast debate. We've seen a lot of them nowadays, but this was probably the first live telecast debate where they had both these gentlemen standing facing each other and speaking about their vision and the future of the United States of America. The interesting part is, Four million people had impressions about that first debate. Three million who saw it on television felt that Kennedy had scored over Nixon, while thousand who had just heard it on the radio felt that Nixon had been better, and which actually translated into that narrow victory which Kennedy had over Nixon. It was the way he was clothed, the way he spoke, the demeanor with which he sat, the way he kept his hands together, the way that he didn't fiddle with his trousers, the way that he was not fiddling with his feet. He was so comfortable. And that translated into that very, very narrow victory. That was first thing which came to my mind when I started thinking and reading about nonverbal communication. The other thing which came again during COVID was the way Andre Agassi handled Boris Becker. Boris Becker beat Agassi by his boomerang serve the first three times that they played. Agassi had no answer. Agassi beat him in nine out of the next 11 times that they played together. And what happened? Well, Agassi noticed after seeing Boris Becker serve repeatedly that Boris Becker used to stick his tongue out to one side when he was serving down the deuce court away. And he would stick his tongue out straight in the front if he was serving to the body of his opponent. And believe me, Agasse used it to his advantage. Now, what do I need to say here? What I'm saying is either by choice or by accident, we may be non-verbally communicate and we need to actually fine tune it so that it spreads happiness and empathy rather than spreading pain. So this is what is so very important where we as empathetic doctors need to build trust before we practice. Hence our truth and transparency to become trust will totally depend on our non-verbal communication. Hence, I feel that we need to practice this and it's a skill, it's not a talent. It can be developed. Wonderful, like you created a very sound platform for us to build on this, uh, on this skill. The first example, the Nixon and the Kennedy, yes, those who saw on the TV, they got both verbal as well as the uh, non-verbal cues. But those who were listening on the radio, they were not getting the non-verbal cues. They were just having the audio part. So yes, that's a wonderful way of uh, bringing out the importance of uh, non-verbal communication. Just uh, before we move on, yeah. uh, you said about that Mehrabian. Uh, can you differentiate between the verbal and the vocal because many a times uh, we, we consider that as a same. Sir, I always play with these three words, why, how, and what. What 
are the words we use how is the vocal tone the pause the respect waiting listening active listening all that is the how and the why is the purpose which is conveyed totally by our empathetic presence so how is the words we specifically use are just those words but how we put it the respect that you show where you sit as compared to the patient all these things will come in our discussion so it's the how part of it the what are just those words 7% how is 38% but why why are we suggesting the operation why are we suggesting no surgery that is the entire picture which is 55% okay good so now slightly different question to dr guruva reddy uh, dr chanda said that uh, we use words we use vocal cues so usually we try to add on the information so whatever we want to convey we usually use verbal and the non verbal information to add on but sometimes like uh, it happens that uh, both are contradictory so let's say that uh, Uh, after my lecture is over someone comes and then says that uh, oh dhiran your lecture was wonderful but the facial expression are conveying that uh, he really did not enjoy the lecture so how can we or like what is powerful verbal or the non verbal what is more powerful so your answer is in your question itself dhiran uh -huh. uh, the verbal <laughs> communication is riddled with a lot of uh, stage acting so you were a patient or a friend or your partner sometimes they love to bluff and sometimes they are white lies in the sense they don't want to hurt you so they might tell a the one you somebody told you that your lecture is good it is a white lie white lie by definition it is a lie which doesn't hurt anyone it doesn't damage any you need to do uh, use a lot of white lies that's a different story so when i am confronted with a person who is uh, signals are different i will completely depend on non verbal communication and that is very very important and uh, that will time and again get you out of the tight spots the same from this side also when i wanted to convey somebody with whom i don't agree and i just say the thing i learned to be white rather than telling a white lie or rather than trying to please him by saying something which he likes to say so i like to be quiet so my answer is definitely non verbal communication provided you have the enough art and science to grasp it it is much more powerful much more useful to assess the situation vis a vis verbal okay and can you tell us the reason why what could be the reason why non verbal cues are more powerful than the words yeah non verbal cues you cannot modify them unless you are a naziruddin shah or a kamal hasan according to me only these two guys are the most versatile actors they can mimic anything from their body but none of us can do that so that's what uh, the non verbal communication the power because the, without telling that's why the psychologists or the uh, crime detectives they are allowed to meet the person in person not the zoom calls not anything they fly thousands of miles for a 5 minute uh, interaction with the person the reason is this one because non verbal communication like gestures and as vivek was telling following on the eyebrows of the forehead these things you do not have any control they automatically happen okay good thank you uh, dr bharat i would like to ask you like you have a vast experience of uh, seeing lot many patients suggesting surgeries to lot of patients sometimes coming across the complications uh, so can you tell us or give us an example where non verbal cues has really give you a lot of information 
which you were not receiving from the patient's story. Uh, thank you, Jiren, uh, and thank you, all colleagues. Um, I think in order to answer this question, I have divided into three parts, OPD, indoor, and the home visits. Like, you know, in the OPD, we have got sort of a series of, you know, the communication coming from the security to the reception and to the our spine associate, surgeon associate. They are the, our physiotherapists, they are trained to do that. So from there, we get a lot of cues. From there, we get a lot of information. Suppose somebody starts misbehaving from the from the floor, then we will get that sort of cues, you know, from the in the in the computer, and we'll get to know that this is what is going to happen, or when the patient comes and enters the data into the computer when at the reception, and when the history being taken, you know, all the physio they will write down the history as well, and they will take the history into detail in order to cut short the time. So we have we follow that green, yellow, red system as well. So that's something which is written in the computer so i would say the computer is the most important tool in any clinic in the current situation or in the current practice so that is what is very important from the data perspective second perspective would be how the patient is dressed up you know somebody says i have significant pain i have significant problem but then if they have good nail polish they have trim nails and you know they are all well dressed then you would say you know this patient has spent 15 20 minutes in getting ready so, you know, that kind of cues that you get from the patient when you see them in the clinic. One most important thing which we follow, we usually examine the patient from the back. So, what we have in the clinic is a mirror across. So, we can see the face. So, when we are examining the patient's back, we can see the face, what the facial expressions are. Whether they are squeezing or whether they are, you know, screaming or whether they have the tenderness or not. So, we can very well judge, you know, and the, and the facial expression. And on occasions for the OPD patient, when you have to explain to the patient that, okay, everything is fine, normal, and you know, the, 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 the buddy or the partner would say, oh, look, I was telling this. And we have somebody, you know, who is sitting in the sofa and says that, yes, this was I was talking about. So that kind of, you know, non-verbal communication we get, and we get those kind of, you know, kind of, uh, and then we note it down in the computer too. So when patient comes back next time, because you know, we have five consultants working together. So we have that information into the computer. So if I have to conclude about the computer, computer are must, data entry is mandatory, and reading the data before you see the patient is compulsory, because then that is what is written in the notes as well. So you know, you we have the grading of patient's behavior too, or you know, and the related behavior. So we grade accordingly, and we know that you know how much we should be giving importance to according to yellow, green and red signal as well. Uh, along with that, sometimes patient comes with guards, you know, somebody actress or hero or hero, you know, they will have that guard, you know, or rather somebody comes with a pistol too. So, you know, you can judge their personality when they enter that kind of personality when they, you know, you need to really know all this and mark all this and point it down into the computer as well, because that is very important for the next person who is going to see patient tomorrow. The similarly, you know, when you examine the patients, like in the OPD, when you have the patient who is in the wheelchair or in the stretcher, you want to see the patient. And when you have to undo or remove the chapels, whether the relative is helping you or not, or is doing it or not, that makes the most important step. Because then we know that, you know, the relatives are going to help the patient and that is at the end result. You know, that is what makes a difference because if relatives are good, taking care, somebody on the mobile when you are talking, you know, and when you are talking to the patient, not attending, that also gives a real good cue as well. So these are the things that, you know, will be able to help us to decide about the patient's movement and when particularly, yeah, I would like to extend about the range of movement. Suppose, you know, if I am evaluating the range of movement, you know, when they bend forward and the clothes they have wear, you know, they are going to really have completely different, you know, when they bend forward. So we make sure that such thing doesn't happen because husband may be observing you when you are examining the patient as well. So that is again, you know, you have to be very careful when you examine the patient as a clinician because you do not want to give negative vibes of yours to the patient and relatives too. So this is regarding the OPD. Now coming to the IPD. IPD, when you enter into the patient, the greeting, the way they talk, the relatives, when they are sitting, you know, having one leg over the other, not, not trying to, you know, attend you, they are the one that gives you the negative things as well. So that is where, you know, your observation makes life so easy and different. And then you really make them understand as well. 
so that is very important so room is well you know sort of properly placed there all the things as well so that is very important i would like to give example about the visit of our spine associate or rather surgeon associate the physios those who are trained you know one fine day one of my physio went to the visit and said sir this patient has been complaining since long but you know what is wrong with them when i go to their room when i go to their house everything is dark you know so no wonder they are going to be depressed all the time you know there is no bright light in their house and one more information he gave me after you know next day sir when i went there he husband was wearing her husband was wearing the underwear of the patient uh, of the female and that is what something you know which again non verbal communication would certainly help because then it goes into the computer so that when patient comes you know we can very well rectify those things as well so in order to just answer my experience about all these things that you know this is this this kind of things go into the computer and that is what helps us as well so non verbal communication communication overrides the verbal as we have already been discussed about that facial expression vocal hesitancy is very important as dr ram said and i think that is what we bring out the patient doctor relationship and it has to be documented it has to be you know read before we see the patient according to the category of the patient we have the behavior pattern as well noted thank you thank you so before we move on to the next point about the uh, how we give signals i would like to ask dr vivek about his experience in a government hospital because dr vivek is at aims and there are a lot of patients so can you share yeah. your experience about this yeah certainly and i was listening and fascinated by what dr bharat dave was saying uh, working in a government hospital with a 100 opds and people running over you and everywhere in the outdoor patient has its own challenges and to have a non verbal communication skills and talent as sir said skills develop sometimes becomes difficult and what we need to understand while doing this i'll just give you an example or i'll like to tell you which recently happened whenever i'm taking a rounds in a trauma center i have got around 5 to 7 residents also who are along with me in the ward rounds and the patient is coming in the night we are operating him in the night and then next day if i am seeing him uh, one of the patients was in elderly 60s and i was told during my rounds that he is not following our commands in the proper manner we are wanting him to do his knee range of motion physiotherapy part and he is very stubborn and he is just not following what the residents are saying which normally happens in a trauma patient who was very well the one day before and then suddenly has trauma and has some issues after that and so he is not able to adjust so easily with them and i went to him i'll just this was just the last one last week and that this thing came to my mind when dr bharat was saying and i was just i'll just say that i held his hand and i asked him by holding his hand how are you and what has happened why what's how is your pain and all of a sudden who was totally not talking to anyone he just burst into tears on my hand holding his head on to my hand and so and said so please i have never felt this much amount of pain any time before in my life i am 65 years old and this is the first time i have ever come to a hospital and people are asking me to do these range of motions i am an artist he was a musician who used to play various music instruments and he said i just am overwhelmed by the situation yesterday i was okay today i am having trauma i have been operated and people are asking me to move their things and move the knees which i am not able to do the range of motion in the physiotherapy so just a holding of a hand and showing empathy to the patient during the rounds when there are six people or seven people and just asking him in a polite manner and with a smile what has happened why are you what is how are you and what is your pain and all his emotions come into the play and when i was able to comfort him and i told him where is your music then out here in this ward if you are so into music where is your music which you are playing 
And he said, no, I was just yesterday I was having injury. So today I'm here. I'll certainly bring that. And next day I can assure you, he, he was and his daughter, both of them had their music system on. They were playing his light music. He was much more calm the next day and very much amenable to improving his own range of motion and his progress further. I would just say that having a proper environment, showing empathy, and just a hand gesture of asking him properly how it helps in creating a rapport between a patient and a doctor, especially in trauma situations. Remember, the elective patients are roaming around everywhere. They know, they know their disease. But in trauma, people are happening it just of a sudden, and next day they are totally on the bed. So it becomes very difficult for them to acclimatize and change and think where they are. So we need to be more empathetic, empathetic and along with them and their, we should be on their side of table rather than on the other side of table. That's what I feel. And that's what I would like to say. Thank you. So now we move on to the next part of the uh, session. And that is about displaying our signals. Already Dr. Vivek gave an example of uh, showing the empathy. Now we want to discuss something very important. And this is very important for everyone, whether it's a senior doctor or a junior doctor. Whenever a patient comes to our consulting room, they are looking at our confidence and our competence. The question they have whether this doctor is really competent and confident or not. So I would like to ask Dr. Guru Vareji, uh, actually this is, you are very uh, like famous doctor. So already there is some aura behind your name. And when patients are coming to you, they already have a lot of faith, trust and confidence in you. But can you give some important uh, tips to the young doctors, how you can convey confidence and competency, show competency to the patient? Yeah, that's a wonderful uh, question, uh, sir. Um, I used to have a colleague in my previous hospital who used to spend 30 to 40 minutes with the patient against my 5 to 10 minutes. And patients come out and they say that they couldn't understand what the other doctor said. So that is, I was just wondering, he was a very good doctor. Then I realized that one day I was just in his uh, consulting room. I happened to be there. So I was pretending as I was reading a paper, but I overheard his conversation. So then I came to realize his lack of assertiveness while explaining. He would say, no, look, you got a fracture. We can treat it with the plaster. Uh, yeah, I think we can fix also. Like that, he gives all multiple answers and he's not assertive. I always tell the youngsters, you be assertive and be wrong, then non-assertive and be right. So even if you are a dogmatic, I won't say a word dogmatic, but you are if you're a very focused on one treatment, even if it is the wrong treatment, if you are assertive and if you convey that in a proper way, patients will buy that. So that assertiveness is very, very important to convey to the patient because patient comes to you with a confidence that you will take care of his problems. As Vivek said, that is a wonderful um, what you call the incidents which happen to me every time. When I go to the rounds, the one thing I say is uh, I have hold my hand. These guys will never leave the hand. You have to literally pull the hand out. That is the beauty of the uh, uh, touch. But unfortunately, our youngsters forgot how to touch the patient. And then unfortunately, this me too uh, has happened in the world and you cannot touch any person and which is absolutely ridiculous. The touch, I call four T's to win any relationship. Time, trust, talk, and touch. Whether it's a wife and husband, father and son, patient and doctor, these four T's are enough to get anybody for lifetime. So that is what most important. And uh, the assertiveness, number one. Number two, you have to summarize the treatment. So that's a lot of the time we tell physiotherapy, we tell uh, precautions, we tell tablets and all that. I got this uh, very good habit picked up from, I don't know, I think from England. Uh, I'll after I say everything, the last minute I'll say, look, 
the antidote, one with the drugs. Literally, I put my hand like this. One medicines, physiotherapy, precautions, knee cap, lumbar corset, and then if the patient is not receptive to this, usually you will be surprised. But the patients also will be counting this. They will be repeating or they will be mimicking you. If those people are still not doing that, I will ask them to repeat that. So these are the ways to communicate your assertiveness and your treatment modality. But as you rightly said, we are all of all all of us in this faculty have got this sweet spot where people already did the shopping and come to us with already fixed mind. So it, it doesn't take much time for us to live to that uh, reputation. Yes, so but uh, yeah, what you said about the assertiveness is going to be very important for the young doctor because sure. uh, many a times when you are not confident, your manner, your non-verbal cues also gives us that same signal to the patient, whether we are willing or not, but that's conveyed to the patient. You mentioned about the four T and one of the T was a trust. And I would like to ask uh, Dr. Ram Chadda on that because the major problem which the medical practice at present is facing, particularly in India, that whether we accept or don't accept, whether we like or don't like, is that doctors are losing trust in, in the mind of the patient. So I would like to ask you how we can convey trustworthiness to the patient. Thank you very much, sir. Um, first and foremost, I believe in that one line that truth and transparency translate into trust. Now to begin, I look at trust as the ultimate level of faith. I'm going to use three English words as my stages of faith. The first is hope. The second is belief. Yeah, Ram, just I would like to interrupt, like whether you have taken this tip from Dr. Guru Reddy of one, <laughs> two, and three. <laughs> sir, I'm mimicking and mirroring him, sir. Okay, great. <laughs> Please carry on. Please carry on. First stage is hope. The second is belief. And the third is trust. What is hope? So hope is that the patient has in his mind because he's heard of Dr. Guruva Reddy as a brilliant, confident and competent person, but he still has to get the feel of his character, the third C. Okay. So hope brings him to Dr. Guruva Reddy's clinic. Hope has to be then converted to belief. That is the way Bharat Dave's security, the secretary, the physiotherapist, the waiting room and other patients talking about the way they have felt develops. So hope is what he came with. Belief is what he develops in those 15-20 minutes he has spent before meeting Vivek Trikha Bharat Dave or Dr. Gurwa Reddy. Now comes that word trust. So what is the difference between trust and belief? So the difference between trust and belief for me is very simple. So belief is when we applaud a person who walks on a rope holding his own child from one point to the other without dropping his child. We see it as a tamasha by very poor people. Trust is when you hand over your two-year-old child to him to do the same. That's the difference between belief and trust. So belief is when he has developed that confidence in you outside your clinic. Trust is what you have to develop once he is with you. Now, unlike the trauma surgeons, the spine surgeons have a very big advantage, sir. And I will tell you why, sir. Sir, we touch the feet of all our patients. And in India, that's the biggest sign of genuine respect. We must agree to that. And actually, it makes us also feel very, very good, sir. It's a part of our 
examination of every patient, every time, every visit to the room that we make, every visit to the home we may make, everywhere we touch their feet. The other thing we do is, sir, and this is how I begin my consultation, is when they walk in, I am standing when my patient and family walks in and I greet them with a smile today with Ganga Jal, which is sterilium. Okay, this is done. So I have actually not physically touched them, but I have offered them something which they have willingly taken from me, my hands. It's done. They're all there. So there is one patient who's actually at a higher level. The attendants are on a sofa. This person is on a couch at a higher level and I am on the level between the couch and the sofa. Very simple. And all of us are actually that way. Whole discussion and presentation begins with that smile. Your smile is not here. Your smile is in the eyes. Your smile is in your face. And that is what is going to disconnect you from the previous patient and connect you to this patient. And it's important. Having done that, we begin with the patient focus. So how much ever the relatives may want to give the history, it has to come from the patient. And the patient should be given the right to speak and he should be heard completely. And our answers should be patient focused. My eye contact is with the patient throughout the process. When he's talking, I am at a lower level and seated. So he is in number one position, sir. I am number two and the family is almost with me. However, after all that is done, he always remains number one. I may then get up and then give my response. In my response, which will be after having actively listened to him, nodded to him, heard him out, asked him a few leading questions, at times even mimicked him in his unhappiness, frowned and his happy moment smiled, which means I am agreeing with what he's saying most of the time to get the complete story out corner of my eye, I pay attention to the relatives, but I may not necessarily agree with them because for me, I'm still patient focus. And in spine, we have to do that. Having done that, I then slowly come with my response, having heard him and the inputs from the caregivers. I never ever am in a hurry to push them out. I believe in answering all their questions as far as I can. And I always sit in a position where I am not fidgeting. I am not attending to phone calls. I'm not looking into my laptop and I'm not taking notes. I have a colleague who's taking the notes. I am focused on the patient. Yes, my questions, which may be new to the patient may be repetitive to my team and they know how to note the answers. When I examine all the positive points that I find, I loudly announce. If I have a straight leg raising, which is positive, I announce. If I have a femoral stretch test positive, I announce. If I have a sensory deficit, I announce. If there is a deficit the patient is unaware of and the family is unaware of, I repeatedly do it and inform the family. I discuss bladder and bowel with the patient first, seek his permission or her permission to discuss with the family or I may not. If she or he disagrees, I hold on and say that, okay, we'll discuss it at a later date when a caregiver who is a part of your family will come. This is done with my chaperone when I'm examining them. So this is the way that I generally build trustworthiness. So it's hope to belief to trustworthiness. That's how I've done it all my life. And I think it's been a good journey. Good. Thank you very much for wonderfully explaining the difference between the three words. Now, uh, Dr. Vivek, I would like to ask you a question which is very important. That most of the patient coming to your institute, they must be wondering whether this doctor is really interested in me or not. Because like say, when they are going to private, naturally they expect the doctors to pay attention. But at your institute, it's very different. So what uh, specific things you do 
to convey to the patient that you are really interested in that yeah so i was listening mesmerized to dr ram chadda what he was saying and yes those things are possible and we can do that but not to that great an extent in a opd or an outdoor patient for a general hospital for us but the most important thing is as was said is total focus for the patient and that's what the patient is looking for and what we need to give to the patient be it anywhere you can be single with a patient inside an isolated room and still not be attentive to him and you can be in a room a full of 10 people but give your complete attention to a patient who feels that realizes that and goes back satisfied and that's the most important thing which a person physician in an opd in a government or in any place where he has to see multiple patients in a single room sometimes because of the paucity of the place needs to do i would say that first of all having an eye contact which sir has said before also totally looking at the patient forward bending the way i am right now i am listening i am leaning towards my laptop trying to be as close or as attentive to you and to the other presenters out here and that shows my eagerness my motivation as well as my curiosity to listen to everything which is being said by that patient and that's what denotes my complete interest in him the second thing is and i'll tell you this is very important i have been in the same place for the last 18 years now and there are patients who come back to me after 10 years or 5 years and this is one thing which i would say if you are able to remember a patient who comes back to you and you know something about his stay during that time i can assure you he gives you a such a belief which goes into the trust as dr chadda was saying that he knows that this guy remember i can if i am able to say that you were on this bed dear and you were out here and we told managed you 12 years back and how are your children at that time and they must have grown big and he is that's what he is coming there for he wants attention care empathy and my complete focus on him undivided attention to him complete focus on his problems empathizing with that making sure that we are in an open and we are not in a stiff position like we and as soon as he comes we start writing in our outdoor patient card that yes tell me what is the problem back problem okay get this x ray and come back that's not the way it has to be done because that's a job as i said what we are discussing today is the difference between a human physician and an artificial intelligence a robot sitting here or a human sitting here who is dealing with the patient and that's what we are discussing and how we can have those interest and display our interest with those patients i would say that many a times what i do while looking and while discussing with the patient is when he tells me a problem i repeat i include that in my summary when i am telling him the same words which he has used like mujhe ek tarang aati hai is tang mein mujhe ek lehar udti hai ya whatever the way he speaks it if you are able to speak the colloquial language the way he wants it to be conveyed to you it also gives an impression to him that yes you have listened to him properly and you are also in tune with what he is saying so these are various things by which we will be able to give our unbridled complete focus and attention to the patient which makes him go satisfied even in a bristling opd of 100 patients with 10 patients inside your room talking to him in a nice pleasant manner with a smile on your face not being overrun by the number of patients who are there and giving your complete attention to him right thank you dr vivek now uh, we all discuss about the smile the empathy but one of the most important thing which as a surgeon we don't like and that is when there is a bad outcome when there is a complication 
So I would like to ask Dr. Bharat, how do you use non-verbal communication while conveying bad results or complication to the patient? We all are good surgeons, but uh, definitely sometimes the complication occurs. And how do we convey that to our patient using the non-verbal cues? Thank you. Um, many, uh, many, many, many sort of points have been covered, but I would like to brief on a few more. Um, we were in a meeting in the annual conference at uh, in ASSI, and one of the neurosurgeon was asked, "What is your complication rate?" Because he is the one who operates the CV junction, you know, craniovertebral junction, and he got up and said, "I have zero complication," and everybody just laughed at him. And he probably, you know, continued to answer, Doc, who is lying onto the bed and who is going to die? And if you say that, you know, you operate me and if something goes wrong, do I consider it as a complication? And that is what sometimes is to be explained to the patient as well. And the four ways you can explain, one, you have sort of typology, patient-doctor relationship or physician-doctor relationship. And one of them is the paternalism where the physician dictates you know that this is something which is important for you and you really have to have it and that is where you know the non-verbal communication will be more important because when you are explaining authoritatively and how receptive is the relative and the patient is that is very important so that is where you know one will say that it is a paternalism second is a consumerism the minute you say that this can happen and the patient really you know is loud and clear and you know he just walks out and throws the files everywhere that again should be considered as a negative thing as well but then that it, that which should be covered into the into the nvc the third is the defaulters you know they both are low because the surgeon is explaining very low calm cool and the patient is also listening very low calm and cool and the fourth one is the mutuality, you know, where both are really high, high. So these are the four ways by which one can communicate the complication, particularly non-verbal way. You know, you will have the sort of patient's reaction coming to you when you are explaining, you are listening to them. And the most important thing we should observe sometimes is the fidgeting. Like, you know, Dr. Ram said about that tongue, you know, coming out. So fidgeting, you know, when the somebody, when you are explaining, they will be having, you know, kind of abnormal movement, getting up, you know, getting anxious. So all those things, they adds into the patient's anxiety and our armamentarium in understanding the patient's compliance and the relative's compliance as well. So these are the things they should go with the gratitude. That is very important because whenever I explain and I operate OC1 cervical, you know, we take the consent dates on table DOT because patient may end up with all kinds of complications. So when such is explained, you know, such thing you have to explain, then you draw the figure, you explain to the patient and that goes with the patient. Then that makes the good, you know, value for both of us, for patient and doctor both, because then that is considered as a proof and that is considered as a kind of, you know, the, 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 the consent, one can say that. And currently, nowadays, we all must remember in order to cut short the, the answer, we must remember that some recording is going on as well. So that becomes the verbal communication, but that is non-verbal for us because, you know, we really need to know that this can be completely contradicting to whatever we have discussed as well. So in short, those gratitude whenever i operate oc1 you know the negative thing which i have explained they become tomorrow my strength as well because i have explained them enough i have understood them well i have assessed their body language as well relatives and the patient as well and the consent has been taken so all those things you know they, they add on so in short just to just to just to conclude that verbal convincing probably you know we all should have it and we should really polish it to such an extent so that we can give the best of best from us. Thank you. You are muted. You are muted. Sorry. Uh, now coming to the most important point is like uh, smile is one of the important non-verbal cues. So there are different grades of smile. And nowadays, particularly in the service industry, there is training for giving the fake smile or the insincere smile. So, uh, Dr. Guru Valadi, I would like to know from you what is the genuine smile and how we can use it in our practice. That's yeah. what I was doing now. 
<laughs> it's a genuine um, or like it's a evident smile yeah i i believe i'm, I'm sure ram knows and everybody knows uh, i i'm known in my patient community as a poor man's patch adams <laughs> i don't know whether have you seen patch adams movie robin williams yes i think you have to see if anybody doctor doesn't see the movie he has to see i play pranks with the patients i become one of them a lot of my colleagues sometimes comment criticize that i trivialize very much and i become very unprofessional and i become very casual but i don't feel that way that is the one which earned my patients and that is one which earned the trust of my patients as ram was saying and smile is the fundamental thing which makes the things proper as i said i always try to crack jokes with the patients but of course it's always a very delicate uh, balance but at the same time when you grow in your career with the humor intent and content within yourself things become very easy you will know where to draw the line and how to make a patient happy there are some two three very simple things which i would like to share i would say the patient has come back to me after 3 months i would ask a question are you feeling better immediately i'll say i'm sure you must be feeling worse otherwise you won't come to me so this sort of some stock was there immediately the patient says oh you lost it so then i put my hand on the shoulder this i'm feeling sometimes i even pinch them so this sort of all again a non verbal communication starting with a smile is very very important genuine smile is very important patients are very clever so i'm telling you the patients of 21st century are 10 times cleverer than all of us they know whether we are genuine or wrong that is what we are in a way better place because in a jungle a single man who is empathetic is smelt and felt by the patient like that and he won't leave you that is why all of us are successful in our practice here because he will be seeing 100 fake commercial doctors but he comes across one vivek who holds his hand and one bharat who looks into his eyes and one ram who will tell a ramayana story so these things will make the boys from men so that's why we have we all successful in that way and that is important a smile the another point is that there is one thing called scornful smile so that means you just just you know corner of the mouth goes into one scornful this thing and that is like a satire satire and i'll tell the patient are why are what are you are saying is a bullshit so that smile you should never use it even if you feel that and the second point is come smile the more you smile towards the relatives the more comfortable they become because end of the day i again one more technique i don't know whether bharat agrees it or not i welcome as many patient relatives into the room as possible the more the merrier because some doctors have got a misplaced tendency that you know only one relative is allowed no with one shot you can impress 10 people why should you lose that <laughs> so i see that all the 10 people come inside and i wait until all of them are seated sometimes my registrar casually sits there when the patient relative is standing i threw the registrar out of the room said no but the relative sit and then only you sit if there, there is a seat so by the time the relatives got the conference are ye doc sab ta acha ye hamara aadmi hai and second thing is you should see in the 10 relatives one relative as ram was telling who will be poking who will be trying to help or trying to interfere that guy is the most important guy because tomorrow even the stars are worse if you come across a complication that guy will bail you out so you have to look at him and make him part of your conversation and he has though he is going to be a decision maker or a partner in decision making that is a very important point again so that again where non verbal communication while you are talking to the patient bit in between you look at the relatives while you are summarizing your treatment but look at the eyes of this guy who is the influencer or who is the important policy maker so smile is very very important even when we of course fortunately our orthopedic department we don't deal with death every day of course oncologists and those people might not be able to smile but we can smile and we can we don't trivialize but we can just casual yesterday one lady came 
she says sir whenever i got my pain in the knee i got a headache also and immediately i laughed to my cousin and literally embraced her and said ma'am i did 20 years of my medical career i never learned that knee and head are connected you are the first one to say and she was started laughing at me so that's how i went okay so uh, you mentioned about the eye contact uh, like making the eye contact with the most important person so let's uh, understand something from dr bharat about uh, eye contact so how much eye contact is okay and how much eye contact is aggressive or offensive uh, i would say 50 70 rule when you are speaking that should be 50% but when you are listening that should be 70% contact so that is something which really one should practice as well but eye contact can be completely mesmerizing too you know patient coming to you now and again now and again it may create interest affection and attraction as well so that is the negative side of the eye contact but as dr gurua said you know dr reddy said that we should have as many number of patients and as many number of relatives when we are discussing and that's what exactly what we do when we have a paraplegic patient whom we need to explain that this is not going to recover and that is where eye to eye contact is very very important because there will be 10 people sitting one of them is going to lead one of them is going to make your life difficult tomorrow so you start finding out who is the one who is that and that you learn with the experience that this guy is the one whom you really need to address and you keep contact you know eye contact with that person as well so that is where you know it will be really helpful to have the eye to eye contact so visual sense which is very important it gives confidence and eye to eye contact is very important for a doctor too because if you are talking your confidence fix with the patient as well and your contact your your eyes will be honest and will be able to you know patient will be able to judge what you are talking about and on occasions you know by explaining them and having kind of you know it just it's an emotion and i often have the same kind of you know uh, sort of uh, the the pilo erection and the tears a drop of tear in my eye as well when i have to explain on occasion to the patient that shows my honesty to the patient as well to the problem as well so this is something that when i have to explain to the patient oh if i have c5 six injury and if i become quadriplegic i do not want to survive but that you can't tell to the patient or relatives so you want to make an effort so that time where i to i contact would certainly help when you are explaining the worst of the worst so so that is very important so in order to conclude the eye contact it's a bond between the patient and the doctor and it is the way it brings and gives a confidence to the patient and all the relationship will become adherent to the eye to eye contact as well and we'll be able to find out who is the leader of the group as well thank you thank you so now we move on to uh, another tool which has become a very important tool so we are going to discuss two things the one is the mobile and the second one is a computer because almost all of us are using this mobile and the computer uh, in the initial discussion dr bharat uh, mentioned the use of computer and keeping even the minute details about the patient in the computer so we'll come to that question later but first of all uh, dr vivek i would like to ask you do you use mobile in your consulting room you are mute sir no uh, again i would say that it depends being in a trauma center and on an emergency call and having a pager or a institute call phone has to be there with me most of the time so i do keep a mobile but it's on a when i'm looking at the patient that's a different matter altogether when we are not using it at all so that's the thing if you want uh, to elaborate that's a different i can elaborate on okay so you are very strict about the use of mobile So yes, uh, Dr. Guru Arady, I am coming to you only because uh, that's a very important thing. How do you use computer in your system? Yeah, I don't use computer like Bharat uh, to tell the from the watchman what are the things to add into the computer. Um, but, uh, I I use the computer. My uh, uh, registrar sits with the computer in front of me, 
and so he because i say o a 1 o a 2 o a 3 like a templates the treatment templates are there so when i say that they automatically type them and by the time i finish with my patient the printed uh, prescription sheet is ready that is why that is how i use my computers but the case notes comes before the patient comes to me and uh, the registrars or the fellows i got love of 15 fellows so there will be enough uh, manpower so they come and tell me the patient i want only three pieces of information the name of the patient whether it is a first time or follow up that's a very important for me and third thing is uh, what is the problem so that's all i need to know the rest of things i build it myself and uh, the mobile i'm very very particular mobile should not be there in the room so my secretary has got a mobile and she answers the things and she knows over the years what is the real emergency call suppose if the phone comes from my wife it's an emergency we have to answer <laughs> so she knows even to interrupt uh, to the patient and then give the phone to me but otherwise she will take all the things and give back to me uh, while i'm driving back from the work to home or when i'm being driven i answer them another important social etiquette which i developed over the years is no phone call goes unanswered by me it may not be real time it will be after some time or the next day morning all the phone calls will be answered so that's what i put it myself but in the clinic strictly strictly no phone call because the patient got 5 minutes of time and you are interrupted two three times in the phone call it happened to me once long back around 7 years back i think in my earlier days when i was using the phone the woman stood up and said that i waited for 42 hours for you and this 5 minutes you have taken two phone calls so you please finish the phone call i'll come afterwards and she walked out that is like a slap on my face from that day onwards i said no phone call come what me so that is a strict thing which we all should propagate to all our young audience now vivek having a phone is different because he is heading a trauma unit in a central institute sometimes it can be between life and death he is answerable but having said that when you see the patient you cannot be interrupted by a phone call but unfortunately our junior generation has got this tendency of the phone with them seeing always the whatsapp it has become a typical addiction so the digital detoxification i would say is very very important uh, uh, tool to learn for the youngsters they should know yeah okay yeah thank you so like till now we discuss about the signals which we as a doctor are sending to the patient now we are trying to look at the other part of the interaction the signals which we are receiving and how we are interpreting those signals so uh, dr ram i would like to ask you about a situation where patient is giving you some information but you feel that this information is not right probably they are lying they are hiding they are not telling you the facts so can you tell us about what will be the non verbal signals or the cues which they will be sending which gives us an idea that yes this is we have to be careful the informations are not correct so first and foremost in back ache we have a lot of these uh, psychosomatic situations and hence we have to be very very aware of malingerers and workman compensation probably we have to be always aware so we are having a low threshold for people like this first we have patients who will be talking very vague there is uh, there can be smoke coming out of the ears there could be uh, sweating from the head there could be smells that he gets which are being associated with neck and back pain so there would be disconnected set of symptomatology which he starts to exaggerate and overdo that's one there's no specificity in the conversation after you've heard him he will give you a story line which will be fragmented there will be no 
sort of continuity in the storyline. The same thing which he said happened three months back, he will say it happened three years back because our histories go on for multiple years. So there is a fragmentation of the history. There is evidence and he claims that there is evidence in the past which he is not carrying. Like he tells us, I had a disc and I had three discs, L45. These words are very commonly used by them. And they come with all sorts of history to convince you that they really had something very major. And you feel that they are not as truthful. So it gets, you get it by second instinct. And when people ask me, how do you get it? I say it's the same way that a coconut seller, when he's selling us tender coconut, can tell us whether that coconut will have water, will have more malai in it. Or a watermelon melon seller can tell us whether it will be red and sweet or not. So it comes by, by trial and error. It's experience, it's expertise, it's not evidence. So this will come. A lot of these people who are malingerers today in today's scenario or are lying to you, they will have grooming issues. They will be either overdressed or underdressed, as mentioned very rightly by uh, uh, Bharat Bhai. There would be something which is different. So there are patients who keep coming again and again all alone. Please understand, if there is a married couple and if one individual is genuinely having a problem, which is back or neck, I can understand them coming for the first time alone, but they will come second time with their partner. There are some people who keep coming alone and alone and alone. These are people where you have to actually take them with a pinch of salt. Next, there is a change in their speech pattern if you ask them a leading question or a question which is contradicting their history, they may suddenly become a little bit aggressive. They may suddenly start talking not about the problem, but about the rest of the world. They will start complaining about the system, their family, uh, everything about the past, about fate. Their problem will be forgotten. These are people whom we have to be very, very skeptical about. These are sometimes you ask them a question, either they'll give you a very long answer or they might just say a yes or a no and keep quiet. Both these situations, you have to be very, very careful. Either he's hiding the detail or he's making a story sitting there, both of which you can catch immediately. So this is the way that you have to get into it. And if you really want truth, so you have to get a little bit personal with them and ask a few leading questions. And don't be surprised if a person has come alone, he breaks into tears and he actually uh, accepts the fact that he was trying to hide something which is very personal. So these are things which will come with time. And it's not that they're hiding by, by their sort of lying to you by choice. They're at times lying because they need help. And it's our duty to help them in that situation. So this is how I work. Okay, thank you for making it very simple and easy to understand. Now, uh, Dr. Parat, the question is like, we have listened to the patient, we have understood the patient, we have examined the patient, and then we want to explain them about the treatment. Many a times, being an expert, we use highly technical words like a lamina, laminectomy, discectomy, and the patient, it goes above their head. For them, it's very difficult to understand all these things. So what are the signals which you get when you are explaining to the patient that they are not able to understand what we are trying to say? Uh, current practice at Stavia has been like this. You know, when we see the patient, we know that patient has come for what? Either for the opinion or directly for the surgery. So this is what we really need to find out by leading few questions, but at the same time, by keeping patients and seeing their behavior as well. Like, you know, we will ask the patient, if you have come for opinion, then this is my opinion is, and you can decide and get operated wherever you want to get operated and you wait for them to react. And many a times patient have come prepared and ready for surgery and they are the different kind of group. That's where you would say, okay, go ahead and with this, this, this. Now, if you really want to convert the first group, into the second group. How do you do that? And that is where the NVC will help. That is where you would really want to wait and see how they act, how they behave, 
and what kind of files they have and the an another thing is if they have not understood and you feel that you know whatever you have explained they have failed to understand then sometime you know they will be looking at you they will be looking at the, at the mobile they will be looking at the other relatives they will be looking at the file they will be looking at the mri which you know they have maybe have five mris look do you have you seen this mri have you seen this mri kind of distraction they will have as well so such behavior will tell you that they have not understood what you have talked about that is very important second thing will be important would be you know the when when you are explaining they will be showing you the history of another doctor as well and they will keep repeating the same sentences as well so that's what the confused mind as well so they are probably not interested in what you are talking about but they are interested in their complaints only and they are the one they should be identified and separated and that is how you can make out that they have not understood it well the another thing is the rule thumb you know the minute you say that they will be you know they will certainly say that okay i'm i'm ready to go i, I have understood whatever i need to so these are the things which really one would really answer or one can um, sort of learn how they behave there are two things which i normally see acceptance and non acceptance the minute you feel that you know they have acceptance then they, there will be thumb rule but then there is non acceptance then the behavior will be completely different what you have talked about and that is what is not understood the way we have you know we have explained them and non uh, acceptance would be violent and many a time we do see you know, person walking out of the consulting room not able to understand not able to do this or that and then you get them in and make them understand give them a glass of water as well so that is very important and second thing as dr ram said about tears in their eyes you know that is very important that it becomes a clue that you know they have not understood or they have non acceptance with what you are talking about so so the facial expression and body language they are the clues that they have not understood and you make them understand better by making them wait and understanding and once you have given them the clear cut guideline you may go away from the room and come back and say that now are you ready to have further dialogue thank you thank you the same question i would like to ask dr guru already uh, it's very uncommon in your practice because most of the time patients are coming after for the second or the third opinion they have understood everything and in your practice you just have to say that go ready for the or get ready for the surgery but still do you come across such situation where patient has not understood what you are trying to explain them and what are the ways by which you can make out that they have not understood yeah it, it happens not very frequently uh, but i can say that we are all in tertiary practice so people already did the shopping did the googling and then come to us but sometimes what happens is especially when i tell them that they are osteoporotic bones i want to put an extra rod to strengthen the swan they will think that there is another surgery so for that what i have got in my armamentary is uh, some old implants with rods and without rods extrusion like that so the moment i say rod my fellow will normal knee replacement implant and another hand with the extrusion rods so i said one visual is worth a thousand words so all those things will be explained by the implant that's number one instead of all this sometimes uh, some people are so thick in between their ears so they can't understand and you will know by their number one not nodding the head because we all have got this tendency even while bharat and ram are talking i'm doing like this because that is a, a universal acceptance method that is non verbal language so very very important and so some people they just do not move the head at all and second thing is uh, they will keep on harboring on the same question you tell them sometimes like icu patient polytrauma there is a 5% chance of survival they listen to that and they say sab theek hota hai sab so again they ask the same question so then you know that these people are not understood the best way to make them understand is i take a white paper and take a pen and i draw the diagram If the model sanar there as a diagram especially when i confront a infected knee which is a common scenario in our group and if it is done by others i have to act one way and if it is done by me i have to act in another way so both are important then i put a paper and pen i start explaining to them this is what happened now this is if we go like this 
path A, option B, option A. Like that, I make an algorithm and show it to them. The second important point is, especially when you confront a patient with a complication under your care, the earliest you sprinkle that I will take care of the financial angle, the earlier you will reach the <laughs> comfortable path. Otherwise, that guy will keep on harboring and he will be suspecting that you have screwed him up and then you're asking more money. So the earliest you give him the signals, it may not be very explicit, but you got to give him subtle signals. I'm sure Vivek is smiling. He doesn't get into this sort of discussions with the financials. But the moment you give early subtle uh, indicators that look, my friend, this can happen to anyone and it is not your fault or my fault, it is unfortunate. But I'm here to help you with even financial questioning also. That's the least I can do. Then that guy will go into a sympathetic path. But uh, having understood whether the patient is understanding or not is a very vital thing. Otherwise, the whole five minutes, 10 minutes, your consultation is a waste of time. They, that fellow will go out and it's it. I keep again dividing the patients into four groups. The first group is called HV group. That means happy and vocal. These guys are very happy with you and they are very vocal. They are the dream patients for anyone. They go all around the world. They go into the Facebook and say, Guru Arad is the best gift from God to Arthur. The second group patients are called happy, silent patients. They are happy, but silent. You and your marketing people or your practice manager should catch them and make them vocal. Then that will add to your practice. The third group, C group, is called angry and vocal, AV group. These guys start from, as Bharat was saying, right from the watchman, they keep on fingering and they are absolutely no qualms about expressing their disgust. These are bad, but if you catch them, because they will let you catch them, because they are very vocal, by doing 180 degrees on the other side, they can become your strong supporters. Within a day, you just appease them, you just pamper them, and they will say, oh, doctor, I misunderstood you, then they will go. The last group is angry and silent. These are the worst group, the most dangerous group of the patients. The successful doctor is the one who catches them young. So the angry guys, they won't say one word. They'll just keep quiet. They take your knee replacement surgery, go out and go into the Instagram, Facebook or whatever is that, but they won't express that when they are with you. So your, your thing should get that again, non-verbal communication, that subtle signs that this guy is not happy with you. You probe him, let him come out, address him, and then send him out. These are the four types of patients. Okay, so uh, we are coming uh, to the end of the symposium, but I would like to have a last question to Dr. Vivek. And that question is very uh, important. I think Dr. Bharat also gave some uh, signals to that, the acceptance and the known acceptance. So uh, Dr. Vivek, when we give a bad news to the patient, let's say uh, the biopsy report has come and that says that it's a malignancy and we break that news to the patient. Now, one of the reaction is the denial. The patient says that uh, it cannot be, I am so fit, why should I have this problem? Or sometimes they think that the doctors have made some mistakes. So how do you make out this, that the patient is in a denial phase? Yeah, so that's a very, challenging thing for the person also the physician who is managing them and it's common also in various aspects it can be for the tumors for the biopsies it can be denial of the fact that you are injured in it it can happen in any subspecialty so the very fact is that as you said they're in the denial phase is one of the early phases as it is said in the grief stages that first is one of the initial ones it's a coping mechanism of your body so it's not something which is unnatural, that's number one. And there will be some expressions or the things which the patient is going to say, which will be suggesting that he is on a denial phase. The first of all, he would always be saying that this is not happening to me. Something has gone wrong. Maybe, you see, this is 
your report is wrong, maybe it is of somebody else. That's the first thing. I'll say with trauma also, because many a times I deal with trauma. You ask and you tell a patient that you have a fracture of your ankle and you might require a plaster. I'll say a simple, trivial thing, not a life-threatening situation. He'll say, no, no, doc, look, I can walk on it. And he will immediately start trying to stand up and say, look, I can walk on it. And as soon as he puts his ankle onto the ground and he is going to stumble and you have to be careful. So that's the first phase. Especially in trauma, the denial phase is the highest because one moment before he was perfectly normal. And the second moment he is injured. And that's what I face every day. The second thing is in the physiotherapy part, I would say that whenever we are, Dr. Guruva was saying regarding the polytrauma patient, that is a very classical thing. When a patient has multiple fractures, you are trying to explain to the patient or his relatives that he might be into some problems or the different issues which can be there regarding the inflammatory and hyperinflammatory syndromes and everything, or whatever you are explaining to them, the seriousness of the situation. And he says, Dr. Sahib, kal se chalne to lag jayenge, na? That's, they are simply not interested or they are simply not feeling that they are having a major problem. They assume that everything is going to pass by and they will walk. We are telling them you have to move your physio elbow, otherwise you will not be able to put your hand onto your head or comb your hairs. He says, okay, he'll listen to you and then say, I'll be able to do all my work with the overhead activities or I'll be able to squat on the floor now. So that is the denial. You just assume that they are not. The problem is many a times they say that they are fine and the doctor is wrong. And the challenge is that many a times they would not consider whatever you are speaking after that into with the severity and the seriousness which it should require. And the worst thing in many of the things as Guru Vasar was saying, they might say that the doctor is wrong. He's not competent and I want to change the, my doctor. So that also we need to take care. So we need to watch out on all these things. His casualness, his feeling that others are wrong and he is the right person. And just the disbelief that anything can go wrong with a normal patient and he will be walking. So these are the things which we should look for. Okay, thank you very much. Um, now I request Dr. Tushar for the two important things. To summarize and then to pass a vote of thanks. Tushar, you need to remember Dr. Guruva's style. <laughs> point one, point two, yes. <laughs> Over to you, Tushar. Right. Uh, so much has been spoken this evening about what is not spoken. So we have been all the time making a verbal communication about non-verbal communication. And this very well uh, establishes the importance of this non-verbal communication. So I'll quickly summarize. Uh, right in the beginning, we established the importance of non-verbal communication. Uh, we then uh, empathize, uh, emphasized on the fact that given the fact that there are two people with equal power of verbal communication, the guy who wins is the guy with better non-verbal communication skills. We said that the power of non-verbal communication exists throughout our practice, indoor, OPD, home visits, operating room, everywhere. The power of non-verbal communications is equal in private practice, in corporate practice, or in government hospital practice. There are certain common points or threads which came about. And that was gently touching the patient appropriately to establish communication and trust, being entirely focused upon the patient constantly by our body language, showing that you're completely interested in his or her pathology. And that person is the most important person to you in the room, uh, leaning into the patient while you're listening to the patient and trying to recollect the past of a patient who has followed up with you. Uh, then the points which came were about smiles and subtle jokes, subtle sense of humor. There were points made about eye contact. There was a point made about the difference between listening and hearing. So listening is an active process. Hearing is a passive process. We have to establish the habit of listening and not merely hearing. There was a strict no-no of staring into your computer screens when you are listening to a patient. An absolute strict no-no about seeing WhatsApp messages and Instagram messages in between your consultations. 
followed by this conversation was what messages the relatives and the patients are giving to us so one very important point is to pick on the most important relative by non verbal communication skills who is going to be the best partner for you in this whole process and then to understand whether the patient is lying confused or has received the bad news appropriately there are many non verbal communication signs so i think that just about summarizes what our esteemed faculty were trying to communicate to us uh they have been in practice you know in different types of practices and uh, handling different types of clients east west north south everywhere so handling different uh, languages different genres of patients but you could see that there were these common threads of non verbal communication so uh, on behalf of uh, dr dhiren ganwada and indian orthopedic association and on my own behalf and on behalf of the entire audience who is listening into i really want to thank from the bottom of my heart uh, dr bharat dave dr vivek trika dr gaurava reddy dr ram chadda who have been so kind to give their time to this such an important topic on non verbal communication and with the permission of everybody i would just like to mention that there are two great books one which dr ram chadda mentioned it's called louder than words by jo navaro and there is a book non verbal communication by david matsumito they are available on kindle you could if you feel interested and if you are of the reading variety you can maybe go ahead and enjoy the process of reading further on non verbal so, sir can you put them in our group the message yes i will do that sir no thank you so, so it's 10:31 mm-hmm. sir i i think we've come to the end of our webinar in well appropriate time so in non verbal communicating manner i thank everybody for being here yes thank you and thank, thank you, you auto tv rishi you can stop the recording thank you bye bye